Texas Rangers jumped all over Arizona. They were up 5-0 in the second, 10-0 in the third. The final score was 11-7. Arizona's bullpen game strategy did not work at all. Good. Texas is up 3-1 now and playing on the road tonight where they are 10-0 in these playoffs. Ooh. So, Wilbon, what's the word for how things look for the Diamondbacks? Dire. That's, that's one of the words. Dire, Tony. I mean, they're facing elimination. You know, if I was going to sort of inject some hope or a scenario of hope, I could say cubbish. Because the Cubs were down 3-1, right? And they got popped a little bit around in game four, and they came back and they won game five at home, and then went on the road and won game six and seven in Cleveland. So this is doable. We've seen it done. That's not even yeah. 10 years ago, seven years ago. So it's, but, but, it, but it's, it's dire. And a bullpen game put them in this position, and good. Because I, I, I find bullpen games in the World Series loathsome. That baseball has sunk to that, has become that. So even though I'm rooting for the Diamondbacks, Tony, can they come back in this? Yes. You can get one good start and get yourself to 3-2. and two. And by the way, they can't be down 3 nothing by the time they, you know, the final strains of the national anthem drown out. You can't be down 3 yeah. nothing in all these games. So they got to get started early, and they got to have a good starting pitching effort. Well, they got Gallon tonight, Gallen, right? They yes. got Gallon, and, and Texas has Evaldi, and Evaldi's record, Evaldi's I believe, in the playoffs four is 4 0 at the moment. Yeah, so if I was looking for a word, I would say bleak or slim or bad. And you're right. I mean, every time Lavula went out to the mound last night and put in a new pitcher, before he got back to the yeah. dugout, the ball was Good. out of the ballpark. Good. So it didn't work. It was strategically horrific. And I will say this. He cannot pitch to Corey Seager. Not for the rest of the World Series. You cannot pitch to him. He now has three home runs, which Tim Kirchin told me today is more than any other shortstop in a World Series ever. Each one was, if not decisive, absolutely critical at the moment. One ties up game one. They win early in the, in the innings. They win game three and they win game four. I mean, he's the hottest guy out there. So it, it's, it's terrible to lose, you know, Adolis Garcia. It's terrible. But if Seager and Simeon hit like they hit last night, it's not going to be a problem. Yeah. They're going to win the World Series. And yeah. that's going to be very strange in this regard, Mike, because it's going to mean after Houston won the World Series last year, if the Rangers win – then the capital of baseball in America Texas. is Texas. Yeah. It's not New York. It's not Illinois. Yeah. It's not California yeah. or Ohio or Pennsylvania. Yeah. It's Texas, and yeah. it's a football state. It's a total football state. Baseball moving backwards in all kinds of ways. Let's move to the National Football League, where the three and five Raiders are making big changes. Fired our head yeah. coach, Josh McDaniels, his offensive coordinator, Mick Lombardi, and general manager, Dave Ziegler. And demoted... His quarterback, Jimmy Garoppolo, no matter how handsome, in favor of rookie Aiden O'Connell. Tony, what do these moves say about the Raiders? And what do they say about McDaniels? What they say about the Raiders is if a whole bunch of emails weren't leaked a couple of years ago, John Gruden would be in his sixth year of a 10-year contract. And none of the people you have mentioned would, would be, be involved with the Raiders yeah. at all, right? And one of us sat on the show a couple of years ago and said Rich Passaccia ought to not be the interim, ought to actually be the head coach of the Raiders because he took that team, fractured as it was, and got him to the playoffs. But no, McDaniels comes in, Derek Carr goes out, Garoppolo comes in, now Garoppolo goes out. What amazed me about this was they released, apparently the Raiders released the news that this was happening at 1 a.m. in the morning Eastern time. So it's sort of like a coup. I mean, everybody that we're talking about has been dumped into a garbage bag like broken glass, right? I don't think McDaniels is going to be a head coach again in the league. I don't, Mike. Um, 9-16 and 16 at Vegas, 11-17 and 17 at Denver, 20-33 and 33 overall, and fired in season in two season. times. Yeah. He, he was a great offensive coordinator with Tom Brady. Everybody's great with Tom Brady. Everybody. If you don't have Tom Brady... Maybe you're not that good. Well, maybe he should be a coordinator, and maybe somebody will hire him. To... There have been people who have been like that, Tony, throughout the history of the National Football League. Look, the Raiders are, are emblematic to me of just a lot of bad football out there, a lot of bad football and bad head coaches, and nobody really wants to say that during games or during the football hype shows. And the Raiders, I, Josh McDaniels, seriously? It was questionable that he even deserved this 
chance, and he gets fired again in the middle of a season. And, Tony, the quarterback situation is just weird with the Raiders. I, I might note locally one Chicago boy replacing another. But Garoppolo, right. Tony, San Francisco told you every year for about three years, we're trying to replace him. And the That's Raiders right. said, okay, no, we'll right. dump our guy to bring you on, even though our former geographic rival, former blood rival, is trying to dump you out the door at every turn. The Raiders seem to make one stupid decision after another, and so here's where we are. You're totally right about bad teams. There are many more bad teams than good teams. There really are. Garoppolo leads the league in interceptions with nine. He's missed two games. He's missed two games. He still leads the Let's league move to that. college football. The first playoff rankings were revealed last night. Ohio State was number one, followed by the other major unbeatens in this order, Georgia, Michigan, Florida State, Washington. Wilbon, do you agree with the committee that Ohio State is currently the best team in college football? Tony, I know I said yesterday that I, if I was voting on that committee, would have voted for Georgia 1. And I would have voted for Georgia 1. But I'm going to say something that we occasionally say on this show. I'm swayed by the reasoning that maybe the committee got this right. I certainly understand why the committee did. Just one reason. You only got to go to one thing. You, you, you go to the victories. Ohio State beat Notre Dame and beat Penn State, both teams at the time. Both opponents ranked in the top 10. Georgia doesn't have that. Georgia's strength of schedule is like 100. It does not have wins as impressive as Ohio State's two wins. That's enough. That's enough to convince me, hold on, Sparky, you're wrong, meaning me. I'm wrong. Put Ohio State there. There's a lot of time to play out. I don't think Ohio State's a great team, but they don't have to be great. They just got to be better than the other teams in the field this year. And right now, for this week, I'm okay with them being judged as that. I agree with everything you said. I would have voted for Georgia, too, because Georgia hasn't lost in 100 years. So I would have put Georgia automatically number one. But the strength of schedule, Ohio State's is 15. Georgia is 100. Michigan is 111. Washington is 75. And Florida State, which is not going to be number one in the first poll because they're from the ACC. And when Clemson is 4-4, four and four, nobody cares about the ACC. And they're 49. So I'm with you on Ohio State. What I found interesting was that there was only one SEC team in the top seven. The SEC, year in, year out, is the best conference. They've won four in a row, five out of six championships, six out of eight, and 13 out of 17, and only one team is in the top seven, which indicates to me two things. One, the committee would be okay if there was only one SEC team in a Final Four, and two, that a Pac-12 team is going to get in this year, Mike. Nah, Tony, a Pac-12 team is going to get in. That's too my much football to be played. We don't know that. Those Pac-12 teams could go belly up while Mississippi, could, I think, which is 10, and Alabama, could, which is what, eight? They could eight. They can win their games. And then what? But if Washington wins out, they're going in. They're going I mean, in if, if they, they win do, out. Let's take out. a break. They're going to lose this week. Coming up, we will ask Ron Darling whether yeah. bullpen games, which Will Bond hates in the World yeah, Series, garbage. are okay by him. Washington's not winning at SC. We'll also ask Ron Darling whether baseball needs to do something to reemphasize starting pitching. Washington's going I think down a, I think in a, the Coliseum. Write it down. I think a one-loss Oregon team will get into the playoffs. They're losing again, too. Loss. They're not. Let's get back into the World Series with someone Wilbon and I really respect, a longtime starting pitcher, World Series champion, now analyst for Turner, MLB Network, and SNY, our friend, Mr. Ron Darling. And, Ron, let's start with this. What kind of chance, this is our baseball question, our small look baseball question, not our big look baseball question. What kind of chance do you give the Arizona Diamondbacks to get back into this series? You know, I, I did their uh, games uh, against the Phillies and the Dodgers, and I can't ever count them out. Think about it. They start against Milwaukee. They had to score six unanswered and five unanswered to sweep them in two games. Then they really routed uh, the Dodgers in three games. And then the Phillies, who had them down, going back to their ballpark, you know, maybe the best home park or home field advantage, and took games six and seven. So I will never count them out. And there is a way for them to get back in it. How do they do it? Well, it's going to take a tremendous effort from Zach Gallen. If he has one of those big games, Cy Young kind of games, like he pitched uh, to this year, um, then the ball goes to Merrill Kelly, who's already proven 
that he can beat the Texas Rangers. So there is an avenue uh, for them, although it's going to be a tough one. One of those ways will not be a bullpen game, Ron, <laughs> which leads me to this. The Diamondbacks went with a bullpen game last night, which to me is dishonorable to have that junk in the World Series. But you started a great many games in your life and won them and won them in the postseason. How does the notion of a bullpen game play to you? Well, um, you know, aesthetically, Michael, I'm with you. It's, it's ugly. It's not what you want to see. You want to see, you know, two of the best pitchers in the game going against each other and trying knocking heads and, and see who prevails, certainly. Um, what, what, what's strange about it is, you know, I played 40 years ago, so we had a chance to play the game whatever way we wanted to play the game. And the intelligentsia or the people that run the game and think of the game today think that this is a good idea. Um, I will argue that when you think of a bullpen game, you think of a, a game that's more strategic, like it's some kind of higher form of chess. I disagree. I think it's just the opposite. I think it's a premeditated, scripted event um, that you are deciding at some point to bring in five or six pitchers that they all have to have a good day for you to win the ball game. That seems like a, a, a tough road to climb right from the start. Let's stay on the notion of starting pitching for a second because it has clearly been devalued. Ron, do you think baseball should do anything to sort of bring back, reemphasize starting pitching? And, mm. and what would you suggest if you do? Boy, that's a great question, Michael. I, I think, you know, this starts at such uh, a, a lower level, a younger level, well, where kids now, um, you know, 40 years ago, I was told to chase outs. Uh, guys today are taught to chase velocity. And in velocity, you have an end result that if you can get to that magic 95 number or above as a high school or a college performer, you immediately are going to get five to six or more million dollars a year to sign a contract. It's hard to tell kids not to do that. So I think we've got a whole uh, generation plus of, of kids that are learning this game as pitchers to chase velocity and not outs. So how is it going to change? I, I don't know. Um, maybe a couple of things you could do. Um, you could have a double hook. I think you guys have heard of that, right? The DH hits for the starting pitcher. But maybe when the starting pitcher is taken out of the game, you lose the DH because he was hitting for that starting pitcher. That might get a, a manager to um, leave his uh, pitcher in there longer. And then maybe more importantly, it's going to take one team, maybe a smaller market team, that is trying to win on the margins anyways, right, with base stealing, with defense, with pitching bullpen, that will say, okay, we're going to draft kids that we envision are guys that are going to be able to throw 125 pitches per game. That might not mean complete games like Fergie Jenkins used to throw or, or Tom Seaver used to throw, but it will mean less innings for the bullpen, more innings for the starter, and hopefully in the World Series, a game four starter. I love the idea of the double hook. Great idea. I, I both, love that both, it would be punitive. I really like that. We'll get you out of here on this. Everybody talks about this all the time, the baseball format. We have seen the 300-win teams go out early and go out badly this year. I'm not knocking who's in the World Series. I've enjoyed the games. But do you think there's any change to the playoff structure that you think they have to make? Well, I, I think it's, it's, you know, it'd be real knee-jerk reaction to change it right now. I mean, it's just, uh, just happening. We're just seeing what's happening. And you're right. Now, we have from 2021, uh, when the Giants won 107, Dodgers won 111. This year, the Atlanta Braves, they all did not make it to the World Series. So there's a part of you that says, wait a minute, this six-month grind, the best team is not in the, po in the World Series. Well, I think what this new avenue has done with extra wild card teams is that it's kept more teams invested. It's kept more fan bases watching their teams. And in the end run, instead of having the best teams always in the World Series, what we have is really more like a tournament uh, like you have in basketball, uh, where the, the team that's playing the best is going to be the team that wins the World Series. Great pleasure to have you, as you know. Ron, like appreciate you, we it. like you very much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. All right, guys. Thank you.
Let's take one last break. Still to come, the Suns, Wilbon's team, yeah. surrender a 20-point yeah. lead over the yeah. Spurs. They went to sleep. They looked at the Chargers last night. Jim Harbaugh's yeah. fellow coaches reportedly want to see Michigan punished. Tony, nobody would beat Ron Darling's teams in today's baseball. Nobody would beat them. They would not touch no. them. No. No. Happy time, people. Happy 53rd birthday, Eric Spolster. Nobody knew who Spolster was when Pat Riley named him head coach of the Miami Heat in 2008. Spolster started in the video tape room. Then he found himself with just a couple of years experience as a head coach when Riley said happy birthday and gave him LeBron James and Chris Bosh to go with Dwayne Wade. Spolster won two championships with them, went to two more finals with them. Spolster is now the second longest tenured coach in the NBA behind Greg Popovich and Spolster has been to two more finals since LeBron left and Jimmy Butler arrived. Year after year, Spolster produces teams that exceed expectations. He does, Tony, and they just get better and better and better in the postseason, which sort of takes after Pat Riley. Spolster, people don't even know about the intellect and the sense of humor and just how personable and engaging he is. He, he's, he's not as known as he probably should be, and I'm sure he likes it that way. Happy anniversary, Lynn Dawson. This is posthumous, but on this day 59 years ago, the Chiefs Hall of Fame quarterback threw for a franchise record six touchdown passes in a win over Denver. Dawson owned the Chiefs single season record for touchdown passes at 30 until 2018 when Patrick Mahomes broke it. Dawson still owns the Chiefs career passing records for yards and touchdowns despite last playing in 1975. When Dawson passed away last August at 87, Mahomes respectfully took the field for the first possession of an exhibition game he wasn't even scheduled to suit up for. The offense lined up in the choir-style huddle Dawson used. The Chiefs then took a delay of game penalty, and Mahomes left the field to a standing ovation. I mean, if you're in Kansas City and you're of a certain age, that's got to bring tears to your eyes. And kudos to Patrick Mahomes for not taking the attitude of, well, that, that was something that happened before I was born. I don't know, which is the prevailing stupid, lazy answer that comes out of too many people now when you're talking about people that came before them and set the tone and were the building blocks, the columns on which their franchises were built. Great for Mr. Mahomes. Agreed. Happy trails to a 20 point lead for your Phoenix Suns. San Antonio's Keldon Johnson stole the ball from Kevin Durant, drove to the basket to give the Spurs 115-114 lead over Phoenix with 1.2 seconds to go last night. Durant did not get a clean look on the next possession and the Spurs completed a 20 point comeback after finishing the game on an 18-7 run. Of the stolen ball, Durant conceded, quote, I should have held on to it, unquote. Johnson, Devin Vassell, Victor Wembanyama combined for 25 points in the fourth quarter. Wembanyama finished with 18 points, eight rebounds, four blocks. Durant, who had 26 points, called Wembanyama, quote, a unique player. When the Suns were up by 20, Tony, I'm watching, and I'm thinking to myself, the Suns are not even awake. They're superior in terms of talent and experience. They built this lead, but they're not awake. I should keep this on. Turned it off, and my friend Jeff Nyan calls me later and says, are you still watching this? Can you believe they blew this lead? They blew it. I turned it off. I blew it. Let me tell you who also wasn't awake. I wasn't awake. Now, Let's go awake. to the big finish. Let's do it. 47 of 50 D1 coaches polled by The Athletic said Michigan should be punished for signal stealing. You're surprised. I am. Did they put their names on that, though, those D1 coaches? Not all head coaches, but D1 coaches. Attached to No. Falcons will start Taylor Heineke over Desmond Ritter against the Vites. You okay with that? Desmond Ritter is coming out of an evaluation for a concussion. He's got six touchdown passes, mm -hmm. six interceptions, okay. a bunch of fumbles. And I like Heineke in Washington. Will Levis will start at quarterback again for the Titans Thursday night against the Steelers. You excited? Excited. Let's not get carried away. But Tannehill has an ankle injury, and I think he earned that start, Tony. Luka averaging 39, 12, and 10. You like the Mavericks to stay undefeated at 4-0 tonight? Yeah, because they play the Bulls, yeah. and it'll cause another players-only meeting. Last one, Pelicans, Thunder, Clippers, Lakers tonight. More intriguing That's game a ball to night, big man. Clippers have won 11 straight over the Lakers, and Kawhi 13-2 and lately against those Lakers and LeBron. We're out of time. We will try and do better the next time. And I'm Tony Kornheis. I guess that's my way of saying Lakers, 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 Clippers. I'm Mike Wilbon. Same time tomorrow, Knuckleheads. You can get the podcast on ESPN app or Apple Podcasts. I do like Oklahoma City, though. Here's Sports Center.